This message entitled, On Filling Jerusalem with Your Doctrine, was delivered to Christ Our Rock Bible Church on August 14th, 2022 by the Rev. Roy D. Warren Jr. The scripture reference is Acts 5, 17 to 32. Then the high priest rose up, and all, they, all that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, that were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. And when they that entered into the temple early in the morning and taught, but the high priest came and they that were with them and called the council together and all the senate of the children of Israel and sent them to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly we found shut with all safety, and the keepers standing without the doors, but when we opened, we found no man within. And when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. And when the captain with the officers brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we come before you here today. We just want to thank you for your presence. We want to thank you, dear God, <clears throat> that you do desire, Lord, to have your way uh, with our hearts, dear God, that we're not always trying to have our own way. And that's part of the problem, Lord, with, uh, with so much that goes on, especially as we move towards the Christmas season. We see it more and more. You know, the world is trying to say Christmas is this and Christmas is that. and uh, But your word says it's, it's something else. And I pray, dear God, that we would just have your way of looking at things. And your name, dear God, will be glorified. <clears throat> Jesus, be praised. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. I want to remind you of something of where this all started, <clears throat> lest we forget, as the scripture says, lest we forget. You'll remember when we started in the first couple of chapters of the book of Acts, in the second chapter, it said that the disciples were filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what it said. And I told you, don't get all hung up on the word ghost, okay? 
It's an old English word that was used back in the 15, 1600s, and that's how it got translated <clears throat> into the Bible, and there's lots of places where it does call him the Holy Ghost. Nowadays, we use the word spirit a little bit more, but it's talking about the same thing. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. And then we went, you know, what, another chapter or two, and we kept seeing that. We, it kept up before us that they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Um, it says in chapter 4, after Peter and John were arrested, and then they were uh, <clears throat> let go uh, by the authorities. And I'm in chapter 4, and it says in verse 8, Then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost. Peter filled with the Holy Ghost. Um, some have suggested that that is said over and over and over again because the disciples were constantly moving into new situations, okay, that were uh, going beyond where they were before, and there would be, need to be an ongoing, fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. And, and some of that can be true, there's no doubt. And then in verse 31 of chapter 4, we saw this. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, and they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. There it is again. Okay, and they spake the word of God with boldness. <clears throat> then in verse 33, we came across the great power and the great grace that was offered to these followers of Jesus. We move into chapter 5 and something changes. It turns out there's a couple of people that just thought they could do what they want and not listen to God. And that was Ananias and Sapphira. It says here that they kept back part of the price. See, the disciples made it clear to them, listen, it was your land. You didn't have to sell it. And you don't have to give all the money to the church. You don't have to. Okay, nobody said they had to. Okay, it's, it's what everybody else was doing, but it didn't, they didn't have to. The problem was they lied about it. They said they did when they didn't. That's the problem. They lied about it. <clears throat> Someday I'll bring in a scripture that I found in the Old Testament just the other day in reading through the Bible that makes that point very, very clear. Maybe by next week I'll look it up and, and share it with you because I, I like seeing things come together, you know, from Old and New Testament how it speaks, one, sh one thought. Well, Ananias and Sapphira, they did go ahead and sell the land and they did give some money to the church, but they claimed it was all of the money. And that's where they were lying. And it says here in verse three, uh, chapter five, but Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart? Instead of you, being filled with the Holy Ghost, why, has, why have you allowed Satan to fill your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Okay. Everybody else is doing what the Holy Ghost tells them to do, but you, you're lying to the Holy Ghost. I just want to, I want to keep that, that stream going. I want you to keep that in mind as we move into subsequent chapters and see uh, how things develop. And so that's, that's why I put that there. Um, I want to um, okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll come to that in just a second. Remember I told you the story about Lincoln and how somebody accused him of being two-faced? And he said, listen, if, if I had another face besides this one, you think I'd be using this one? You know, uh, and, and, he, and he used comedy like that. I've read much, much on Lincoln uh, through the years. And uh, he was a real comedian. <laughs> uh, and I don't mean that technically, but I mean he had a sense of humor. And he could bring up stuff that would really nail it. And it would set up the things that he's saying to be remembered. You know? A week later, somebody would say, do you remember what Lincoln said? You know? And boom. Praise the Lord. 
Now, with all these healing miracles and special applications that Jesus was allowing the disciples to be able to do, uh, it, was, it was time to be about the word of life. That's what it says. He they tell him to go back, the angel of the Lord. Well, I should, let me go ahead and cover this. Wait a second. Yeah, here we go. Let's take a look at this and see how this really comes together. It says, uh, the high priest, verse 17, the high priest rose up and all they that were with him in the sect of the Sadducees. Remember, we talked about them. You remember who they are? They're sad, you see. You remember that, right? Okay, uh, people in the nursing home, they get a kick out of that kind of stuff. <laughs> I shared it with them this past week. And, and they were filled, watch this, they were filled with indignation. Now these are the religious leaders, they're not in a good place, they're fighting against God, they're fighting against Jesus, they're fighting against the apostles, but, and we were told that they were filled with indignation. All these other people are filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, all the way along. Until you get to chapter 5, and then, you, and then you find, you know, Ananias and Sapphira basically filled with Satan, I guess you could say. And then to get to later on in chapter 5, practically right after that particular story, we're told they were filled with indignation. They were bugged. Okay? They, they were, as what it means is they were envious. Okay? They were envious. They were bugged. Zealous is the Greek word that's used here for this indignation. There's a jealousy with malice. They're bugged, okay? And they laid their hands on the apostles. That wasn't for prayer, by the way. <laughs> that wasn't for prayer. Oh, no, they laid their hands on the apostles, grabbed them by the shoulders, and dragged them off to jail, threw them into a cell, all of them, all 12 of them, all everybody into the cell, and, and locked the key, and or locked the, the gate with the key and uh, probably would have liked to have thrown away the key, but they were in this common prison. That's what it says, common prison. And then we come across what's known as a contrastive conjunction. And by that I mean, you know, the word and is a conjunction. It conjuncts. It puts this thing together with this, you know? I had a piece of pie and ice cream, okay? Pie a la mode. I didn't really. I'm just getting primed for it. <laughs> anyway, um, so, <clears throat> and is that, con con is that conjunction. But there is something called a contrastive conjunction. And that means that the two things that are being conjuncted are contrasting, okay? It says in verse 19, but the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Amen? See, that's what I mean. It's, it, it's about time for the words of life. Okay, they had been filled with the Holy Spirit and they had that life in them and they were now going to speak it forth. They were being told by the angel of the Lord. And I've told you before, there are a lot of Bible teachers, scholars and so forth that believe when it says the angel of the Lord, it's talking about a um, manifestation of the Christ in human form. Okay. And so what that means is, this is, a, and by the way, I don't know if I told you this, but I have my Bible, I have a Bible program in my gizzy, in my little computer thingy, and it goes through the whole Bible. Well, Cindy and I have it set, uh, you know, McShaney plan, it goes all the way through the Bible, four chapters at a time, all the way straight through. That's what I, that's what we've followed for years. You can do a lot of different things, you don't have to do it that way. But anyway, that's, that's what we've done. Well, uh, when it gets to a place where the Bible says it's the angel of the Lord, 
It uses the voice of Jesus. When that angel speaks, it's the voice that's used of Jesus. Okay? Now, what that speaks is that evidently the person that put McShane, for example, who put that Bible plan together, he also believed that when it talks about the angel of the Lord, it is the, uh, the pre-incarnate manifestation of the Christ that is showing up. Remember the Lord of hosts? Remember the Lord of the armies of Israel? They came up and showed, showed himself to Joshua on the other side of the river. And, and Jericho's there and it's about to be taken. And he has a conversation with them. The Bible says that's the angel of the Lord. And it goes, and, and once again, it's the voice of Jesus. And that's repeated in, oh, it's in Daniel, it's in, in numerous places. Now, you don't have to believe that, okay? You don't have to. I find it helpful. I find it helpful. This is so important that Jesus himself is opening this up to people. Okay? Pre-incarnate. Pre-incarnate. And by that I mean before Jesus. So it's not Jesus the human being. It's the Christ, the second person of the Trinity that is speaking this forth. Okay. There are also places in the Christmas story where this shows up. Now, how God manages that, I'm not even going to try to explain it. It's so important that, that even the Christ that is filling the baby and the human being of Jesus is able to speak for this truth. All right. Like I said, it's not mandatory that you believe it. You know, like I said, everybody needs to believe in the virgin birth. Well, this isn't mandatory, but it's, I think it's very helpful to see it this way. But the angel of the Lord, by night, opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand, and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Praise the name of Jesus. Amen. Glory to God. They have been filled with the Holy Ghost, and they have the words to prove it. And so that's there to go back and go do that. Now, you notice they don't argue with the angel of the Lord. <laughs> they don't argue, you know, because this is post-resurrection. This is in the days of Acts, okay? I wonder if the voice of Jesus sounds forth in this particular story, and the disciples go, I know that voice. I know that voice. I think it's just helpful to see it this way. Many Bible scholars do see it this way. So, but nobody says you have to, you know, hold on to that and, and think that. But I, I, I personally believe it's true. All right. So they've been filled with the Holy Ghost. They have the words of life to prove it. And then came the test. All right. <clears throat> Let me illustrate this. Uh, 1130 AM, 1130, it's not, no, that's not now. <laughs> it's not even 11 yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, 1130 AM on the 30th of May, 1953, Sir Edmund Hillary ascended to the top of the highest mountain in the world, Mount Everest. At the summit, he planted the Union Jack, the British flag okay, for the British Empire, culminating years of, of planning and preparation and days of agonizing effort. No man will ever climb higher than Hillary did in that day, all right, 29,002 feet above sea level. He had reached the pinnacle. There's another story that's somewhat similar to that, I guess you could say, in Genesis chapter 22, records a climb that was in some ways much more difficult than Hillary's ascent on Everest. When Abraham climbed Mount Moriah with his promised son, Isaac, he faced the ultimate test of faith and endurance, the final exam to end all final exams, so to speak. It represented the pinnacle of sacrifice for Abraham and the pinnacle of submission for Isaac 
What made the climb so agonizing was not the terrain, but rather the assignment that it was to be carried out at the top. God asked Abraham to offer his own son as a sacrifice. The son who was the very promise of God himself. You know, it could have been a thought in Abraham's mind. If you do that, God, then what happens to the promise? It was explicable. It was inconceivable. But through this test, God was, try, was saying to Abraham, I think you've matured to a new level of faith, Abraham. I believe I can test you and that you will prove faithful. And in a single afternoon, Abraham's hope was put to the test. His faith was put to the test. And his love was put to the test. God will have nothing less than all of us. And Abraham offered God all that he had. I'll never forget one day in seminary, I was in this particular class and the professor used this illustration of Abraham and Isaac, you know, about to be offered. And he opened it up to make it more personal and he said, how many of you have children? And I had the two, Kara and Joel. And um, so he zeroed in on me uh, to ask me further questions about it. And he said, your son, right? Son, Joel, yeah, son. Could you do this? Could you go ahead and offer him up? Well, I really, I mean, I started to cry right there in class. The professor didn't know what to do. And I tried to explain that I, I, I guess I came down to the idea like, if I knew it was God, if I knew it was go of God, but I would be fighting hard against that. And yet, Abraham knew that had he actually killed Isaac, that God would have to raise him from the dead. He knew that, and he would have his boy back. He's not a boy, he's about 35 years old, this Isaac, okay? So it's not just a little tiny kid, you know. <clears throat> On filling Jerusalem with your doctrine. See, that's what God's doing when he gives us his word, when he gives us his truth, when he says this is the way it's going to be. He's calling us to go ahead and fill Jerusalem with your doctrine. Fill it, fill it with your faith. Fill it with your truth. Praise the name of Jesus. For us, the pinnacle isn't a certain number of feet. You know, is it over 29,000? Is it less than 29? You know, how tall is this place? Okay. It's a matter of the true elevation of the heart. Amen? Look at verse 21, would you? Verse 21, And when they that heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. No argument. Hey, God, don't you know we were already here? We already did this. We already proved ourselves faithful. We went and taught in the temple. That's where we got arrested. That's how we got thrown into prison in the first place. 
But the high priest came. Now, remember, these religious leaders, they weren't really based, they weren't really being faithful to God. They were coming against God and his truth. And they were with him, and they called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, you know, the Sanhedrin, and they, and they sent to the prison to have them brought. Okay? But when the uh, uh, officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told them, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety. We opened the gate and we looked around and, and we didn't see, any, we didn't see uh, anything wrong. And the keepers standing without before the doors, before they got into the inner prison, that common prison. But when we had opened it, we found no man. We thought they were in there. We assumed they were in there. Who could get out? So we opened the gate and we found no man within. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. In other words, what was going to become of this whole thing? You know, how bad was this going to get? The word grow in the Greek is ginomai, and it means to cause to be or to become. But what is, what is this going to grow into? What, what, how much trouble are we going to be in because these guys are gone? <laughs> That's really what they're thinking. <laughs> okay. Okay. Whereunto would this thing grow? And then came one and told him, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence. <laughs> you know, why don't you? Because they feared the people. Without violence now they brought them, lest they should have been stoned by, the peop by these uh, other people that really like the things that are going on with the disciples. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest asked them, now watch this, saying, did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in his name? Didn't we tell you to shut up? Didn't we tell you to knock it off? Didn't we tell you to don't use his name? Don't teach in his name. And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend besides that to bring the man's blood upon us which they did made it clear you're the guys that crucified him you're the guys that wanted him dead you went to the Romans and said we need this guy dead then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. If people say one thing and God says another, you listen to God. Amen. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus. Watch this. Whom ye slew, you killed him, you hanged him on a tree, and him hath God exalted with his right hand, oh, we're talking about God's right hand. How powerful is the right hand? You know, that's the dominant hand, generally speaking. No offense, Jason, but, you know, it's the dominant hand, okay? So the hand of strength, okay? God's right hand has got to be incredible, people. Amen exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things and so is also the Holy Ghost. Because <laughs> the Holy Ghost is inside you guys, talking to the disciples now. The Holy Ghost is inside of you and that's what led you back to the temple. That's what led you to do what you did in the temple. And that's what leads you out to this place to do what you're doing now. And so is also the Holy Ghost. That's what it says. Whom God hath given to them that do what? That obey him. Praise God. Amen. 
You have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, with your doctrine. You know, one of the biggest issues I think that is out there today is sexual temptation. Because Satan knows if he can just put something in front of you like that that just eats at you. And, just, and you, st- you can rationalize it. Well, I'm allowed to do this. I'm allowed to do that. You know, that, that's why it's such a big thing in the scriptures. That's why God comes against the perversions and so forth so much. Because he knows that's the thing that a lot of people are going to fall for. Regardless of the trends, sexual, I mean, regardless of the trends or specifics or whatever, sexual temptations have always been with us, and they are here to stay. I mean, they're going to be there. We're living in a lost world, and that's going to be Satan's primary attack. It is. You know, he's even got pastors and churches falling for the lie. In Homer's Odyssey, the sirens, which were the young women that were singing out on the rocks to lure the sailors closer to the rocks so their ships would hit the rocks and so they would crash. These sirens were mythical, of course. Not, you know, you understand that. It was, this was all a story. Sirens were mythical, evil creatures, half bird and half woman, who lived on an island surrounded by submerged, jagged rocks. The ships approached the island and the sirens would sing their beautiful, seductive songs, luring the sailors to their death. When Odysseus' ship approached the island, he ordered his crew to fill their ears with wax. You know, we're always running the doctor trying to get the wax out. They said, fill your ears with wax so you don't hear it. So you don't hear the temptations. To muffle the siren songs. This done, he commanded them to bind him to the mast as they passed the island so that he could not change his orders. On another occasion, the ship of Orpheus sailed by And Orpheus sang a song of his own, so beautiful that his sailors did not even listen to the sirens. The destructive siren song of of sexual temptation can be overcome, but not by ignoring it. As the stories of Odysseus and Orpheus illustrate, we must be more proactive than reactive. You know, it's not enough to be able to say, oh, I can handle that. So you go ahead and get into that situation and you go to that office party and you do this and you do that. And I can handle it. I, I, can, I can say no to, it, to, to that. All right. But you've got to be, but that's not proactive. That's only, you're going to be reactive. And in the midst of the situations, reaction is not near as strong as this being proactive. We must understand that such temptation is common and have a plan to deal with it. No matter what we choose to call it, sin is sin, and God is not confused about it, although too often we are. We live in a a moral universe and one in which sin has its consequences. 400 years ago, before the law was read, you shall, commit, you shall not commit adultery, was given to Moses on Sinai. Joseph told Potiphar's wife that to have sex with her would be against God's law, God's word, against God, period, really. Joseph's parameters were in place long before Potiphar's wife propositioned him. He knew what he would do long before it ever happened. He knew his answer before he ever heard the question. God, see, and that's really the way we got to deal with life, really. Don't wait till you're in the situation to weigh it out, you know? No, get solid in God's word. That's what Joel's talking about. Learn some of these verses, 
go ahead and get them in your head, you know, so that it's it's there. And then when the situation comes up, you your body, is, well, your mind really, is more apt to go along with what God says than what the world is trying to lure you with. God was no more real to Joseph than anything else in his life. It was it, it was this undeniable reality that enabled him to live a life of sexual purity. Praise the Lord. Say no to it before it ever happens. Anything like that, any form of sin, and then you will be saying no to it when it does happen. Our place is to fill Jerusalem with our doctrine. That's what it says. That's what it says right here, okay? They're being accused of it, but hey, it's the very thing God told them to do. Ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. Praise God. You've filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. That's, they think it's a bad thing as they accuse them of it, but it's a good thing. It's what God's calling us to do because we are filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen? And being filled with the Holy Ghost, we will then hope, try to influence anyway, others around us to also be filled in that way. They'll look at us and they'll say, what are they filled with? You know, I saw Ananias and Sapphira and man, they dropped dead. Dropped dead. Well, they were filled with Satan. All right? But God's people are to be filled with his Holy Spirit. We are to fill Jerusalem with our doctrine, with our teaching, is another word for it, okay? Did you ever notice that appearances can be deceiving? Appearances can indeed be deceiving. And I want to, I just, I'll give you one more illustration of this and, and we'll close, okay? Sometimes the true qualities and character of a man or a woman are not readily obvious to the watching world. Kenny Walker, for example, wasn't a very likely candidate to become a star athlete. He was struck with meningitis uh, as a two-year-old and rendered totally deaf and did not begin to play sports until he was in high school as a sophomore. In Kenny's senior year, he was all state in football. Couldn't hear a thing. That might have helped with the noise of the crowd. I don't know, but you know, everybody's got instructions. Can he do this? Can he do that? Run this way, run that way. And they had to do things a little bit different because he couldn't hear. In his senior year, he was all state in football and basketball and received a football scholarship to the University of Nebraska. There he was voted All-American two years in a row and graduated with a 3.2 grad, grade average, point, grade point average in art history. When Kenny uh, took the field for his last game, at a Nebraska Cornhusker game, 76,000 fans in the stands rose <laughs> in a standing ovation. But not one person applauded. He couldn't hear it. So they didn't applaud. They did not applaud this deaf student with audible clapping. They applauded him with sign language. As a tribute to his remarkable achievements, Kenny Walker went on to become the only non-hearing person to play professional football, and no doubt a role model for generations of other unlikely athletes who would follow him. I mean, since this illustration was even given, maybe there have been some. Maybe some had that surgery, you know, where they put that thing on the side of your head and you can hear, you know, it could be. But up to that time, he was the only one. Jesus Christ was not a likely savior. He did not look the part, 
According to the prophet Isaiah, he didn't look the part. He was not the kind of Messiah that central casting would have ordered up, nor was he the kind that his own people were expecting. But in the, but in the fullness of time, he came to die for the unlovely and the outcast, and he became a perfect sacrifice for the sins of men. Ultimately, we will receive his due, he will receive his due praise. One day, every human being on earth, in heaven, and in hell is going to honor him. Not with, sta with a standing ovation, but by kneeling and bowing low. For many, it will be too late. But for another many, it'll be just on time. In recognition of his awesome magnificent magnificence, every man will call him by his true title, Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Don't be fooled by appearances. You know, I mean, I think that's probably why Lincoln said, you know, if I had two faces, would I be using this one? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm being honest with you, Lincoln was saying. I'm being honest with you. Truth is often wrapped in paradox and revealed only to the man or woman who is willing to look with more than a glance. If you have not looked intently into the claims of Jesus Christ, you really ought to do so today. Amen? Really ought to do so today. God is looking for a people who are willing to fill the holy city, even heaven, depicted as Jerusalem here, but even heaven, with your true teaching, with your true doctrine. Praise God. And you know what? That's one place where everybody's going to like it. I mean, if you're going to go up there and give them the true doctrine, the true teaching, the true truth of Jesus and God and the whole, whole nine yards, so to speak, okay, that's one place where you're not going to hear any objections because everybody there got there the same way you did, by faith in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for this truth that is before us. We are called, dear God, like these disciples were called, to fill Jerusalem with our doctrine, to fill this world, hallelujah, with your truth, whether it likes it or not. Hallelujah. And we look forward to the day, dear God, where we can uh, share it all up in heaven with our loved ones, and everybody's going to go, Amen. Amen? I said everybody's going to say, Amen. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Glory be to God Almighty. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for your mercy and grace here today. Thank you for this word, dear God, that is before us. Help us, dear God, to see that uh, it is a matter of the truth. And I do pray, dear God, that we'll just keep always giving you truth. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. You know, can I just say I often wonder what heaven's going to be like. You know, the Bible says that there is no marriage in heaven and there is no giving in marriage in heaven. So is going there a matter of, you know, hugs and kisses to everybody we knew before and especially, you know, my, my wife and family members and so forth and so on. No, I, I have a feeling that our focus is going to be much more on Jesus. I think it's going to be much more on Jesus. I don't know what heaven's going to be like in, in terms of that. I'm just guessing from a couple things I'm seeing there that our focus is really going to be Jesus. I, I, I think it's... I, I, Maybe that's all I can say about it. Jesus be praised. 
Jesus be praised. Amen? Jesus be praised. Jesus be glorified. Jesus be everything in these days while we await that love, that, 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 that great, I'll put it that way, that great reunion. I thank you, Lord, that you are merciful and gracious and loving. And I thank you, dear God, that you'll have all the glory. Hallelujah. That you will be glorified. We look, dear God, for your mercy and grace to be felt and to be known uh, in this day, and we know, dear God, that we are being called as the people of God to be filled with you and to go ahead and fill Jerusalem with our doctrine. Fill the church with our doctrine. Fill our homes with our doctrine. Fill our relationships with our doctrine. Fill every heart with our doctrine. Let that be to your glory, dear God. Let it be to your glory. Hallelujah. In Jesus' precious and holy name, we thank you, Lord. You're worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. You're worthy to be praised. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.